well as the ecological influence of their organization in all aspects of their operations. Corporate social responsibility often includes activities or programs that give back to communities as well as promote environmental sustainability. These practices differ. In that give specialists that we develop. In fact, I've been told that even um, um, I've been told that even um, when you take local content, that also do a lot of us. They are still in the industry, uh, Chairman. Gold mining communities in the western region of Ghana have experienced the destruction of vegetation, water pollution, soil contamination by activities of mining due to rapid growth and dependency on the mining of natural resources within the catchment area of mining communities. These circumstances, with repercussions of illegal exploitation and inefficient management of corporate social responsibility, place organizational goals above the communities and the nation. I therefore invite various stakeholders to assist in various reclamation and conservation programs within these areas. Chairman, last year, during the Ghana Gold Expo Mining Week, I spoke about the institutional disconnects. In my view, I presented that it will be good for educational institutions and researchers to begin to form partnership with key industrial players in the mining sector in order to foster deep relationship that will spell out the challenges in the sector, the opportunities that present itself, and of importance attract international collaboration. It is for this reason that the Ghana Gold Expo Foundation and Western Regional Coordinating Council have extended their cooperation with the University of Oxford in the UK to undergo their workshop through the support of various stakeholders. The purpose of this workshop is one, to examine the relationship between corporate social responsibility stakeholder engagement policy, community complaint, and the judicial responsibility to stakeholders. Two, host community engagement that focuses on corporate social responsibility specific to health, education, gender, infrastructure, and graduate empowerment. Three, investment agreement between government and the mining companies and the role of managing royalty funds encompassing the theme of stakeholder engagement, human rights, reporting, and impact assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, to end, I would like to say that I'm happy that the Bet of Good Expo 2020 has brought a lot of outcomes. The success of this outcome has taught us that we can cause big things to happen if we only become resolute in our thoughts. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank Suleiman for his wonderful work on the activated carbon that needed to be produced in Ghana and now is being produced by the University of uh, Mines and Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that all organizations encounter ethical issues in its basic operations which can prompt an organization either to make improvement or to engage in unethical behavior. One method that constituted a positive response to ethical dilemma was a corporate social responsibility, which involved the self-regulatory function whereby a business maintained ethical and legal business practices. Corporate social responsibility is a social contract between organization and the community in which they operate. Based on above information, I envision that Oxford University will be able to collaborate in the long term with Ghana Gold Expo Foundation to create more workshops that revolve around CSR framework, reporting, and impact assessment in host community. To conclude, we anticipate that the workshop will bring key stakeholders to pledge 
their commitment to creating sustainable corporate social responsibility practice and skills in their endeavors. It is expected that this will help the formalization of the ASMG and large scale mining sector with a clearly defined and practical CSR framework, which will enable the Minerals Income Investment Fund and the uh, Minerals Development Fund to mobilize royalties, ensure social development, and over. Please, let's do it better for the minister. Thank you very much. And indeed, we are talking about the $7 billion industry. I am going to call on a very important person here this morning to set the scene for us. Um, to do this, and I have been told that uh, conference microphones are working, so you can feel comfortable, sit on your seat, and deliver your presentations going forward. I'll call on Professor Miles Lame. He's a director of African Studies Center, Oxford University, and responsible for CSR in mining in Africa. So um, please, let's give it up to Professor Miles Lame. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Honourable Chairman, um, esteemed guest, uh, Honourable Minister, thank you very much for the introduction. We are delighted to be here working uh, today with Ghana Gold Expo and with yourselves. Um, may I ask uh, for the PowerPoint presentation to be brought up uh, on the screens, please? Thank you. I want to set the scene by uh, talking a little bit about the history of corporate social responsibility, particularly as applied to African extractive industries, and particularly to think about the question of why uh, something which should encourage positive relationships between companies, states, and citizens is often the subject of controversy and complaints. And think about this perhaps from three uh, equally important uh, perspectives. States, the role of the states and regulation, uh, the role of corporate policy and practice, but also crucially the third actor, the communities concerned, the communities affected by mining and the communities who participate in mining. So I'm not going to talk specifically about Ghana. I want to talk in general about Africa. The idea of corporate social responsibility in the 20th century is one that evolves really in relation to liberal democracy and participation. The idea that companies had moral responsibilities to their workers, their workers' families, and the community in which they operated. And that led, by 1979, to Carroll's definition of corporate social responsibility. He puts it like this. It's the social responsibility of business encompassing the economic, legal, ethical, and discretionary expectations that society has of organizations at a given point in time in other words, that it can change over time. Now, companies in the West were increasingly expected to negotiate with trade unions to meet a growing set of legal and social obligations. But of course, corporations in colonial Africa had, in that colonial context, few such responsibilities to their workers and even fewer to the communities in which they operated. The injustices and inequities of colonialism, we could say. But colonial era mining companies did provide limited housing and social services to their workers, not because they were kind philanthropic people generally, but because they were obliged, or because they were obliged to by the law, but because companies needed to build new townships, new infrastructure, to ensure that their industrial operations could function, to house the then thousands of workers operating in most mines. But that sowed the idea that mine company towns, the basis for urbanization in many parts of Africa, that mine companies had particular responsibilities to house workers and care for their families. Now, before and after independence in Africa, foreign-owned companies came under growing political pressure to improve workers' wages and conditions and social provision for families. Many such companies, including here, were partly or fully nationalized by new independent governments, which of course changed the political relationship between state, company, workers, and citizens. 
And there was often a tension. Many workers expected after independence to see higher paying conditions, but governments, unsurprisingly, were often more focused on ensuring greater taxes and royalties for their growing development programs. And there were also tensions in many places between national government and regional government over relations to mine companies in terms of the distribution of that income. State ownership by largely authoritarian governments gave way in the 1990s to market liberalization under now mainly democratic governments. But in a context where that early developmental hope was replaced by economic decline, privatization brought a new wave of initially foreign owners who sought to rid themselves of direct responsibility of housing provision and other social services, a burden that often then fell on poorly funded government agencies. And we know that in African countries, those privatization processes were corrupt and underhand. They handed power uh, of responsibility over those companies to individuals in some cases unable to run them effectively, certainly in some of the countries in Central Africa where I research. Workers, however, continue to demand social provision from new private owners, criticizing them often in a way that expressed a kind of nostalgia for that earlier period of corporate-run services. By the 1990s, CSR was formally established as a recognized need for corporations globally, and that is helpfully recognized, I think, in, in Carroll's pyramid of CSR. Some of you will be familiar with this. I have it on the slide here, the idea that the economic base for CSR is profitability, and then that enables increasing levels of CSR provision to be met. The growth of more formal programs of CSR reflects a number of key factors. As privatization occurs, it involves new legal regulations over companies to operate in a socially responsible way. And in a liberal democratic context, there was increasing popular and media pressure to do so. Mining everywhere saw increased mechanization, so the large, unskilled workforces employed directly by mine companies in the mid-20th century, an individual mine might employ 20,000 workers, were replaced by smaller, highly skilled sets of workers, so that the large companies who had effectively provided resources to communities in the past by direct employment could no longer do so, and now needed to provide other forms of services. Thirdly, Earlier mine companies now had to take into account the environmental movements, initially from the West from the 1970s, but arriving with a very strong recognition of historical and current pollution in the 1990s via environmental impact assessments. So then disputes and questions arise about who is responsible for current mining activities, but also historical mining legacies of pollution in water and soil and so on. And fourth, an international and national developmental context provides a range of frameworks for the uh, implementation of CSR. So we're aware of the UN Sustainable Goals, an overarching framework for the reduction of poverty and inequality, health, education, sanitation, food supply, all of which can be addressed and are addressed by specific CSR programs. SDGs commit signatories to economic growth and employment growth, but equally to sustainable consumption and production patterns, something that might be difficult to manage. In the mining sector, the ICMM's mining principles set out 39 performance indicators, including sustainable development, human rights, proactive and transparent engagement with stakeholders and environmental commitments. Closer to home, we have the African Union's African Mining Vision, which states that the continent needs to achieve, quote, transparent, equitable, and optimal exploitation of mineral resources to underpin broad-based sustainable growth and socioeconomic development. And here, of course, in Ghana, we have the Mines and Minerals Act and its various uh, adjustments. But also, companies face civil society frameworks and initiatives such as Publish You Pay, where we see the focus is less on legal and company codes of conduct, and instead emphasizing implementing promises made, as well as transparency of accounting and capital flows. So mine companies have come under pressure to meet this growing range of demands. And from the perspective of communities, um, companies have been the beneficiary on a global level of a sustained period of high mineral prices, 
particularly uh, as the result of Chinese demand. I know the dynamics of the gold trade are slightly different, but um, on the continent as a whole, we've seen high prices and great profits made by many of the mine companies in copper, cobalt, uranium, and other minerals. And many new foreign investors have also been accused of systematic tax avoidance, uh, offshoring their profits, um, there is also the tension, which is uh, clearly true in many mine uh, producing, mineral producing areas between large and small scale production. So in recent years, we see a number of key trends. Mine communities now are thought to encompass not only workers, but local community representatives, those affected by environmental impact. They've become more vocal and organized in challenging and criticizing company CSR activities. Their demands are more coordinated than ever with local civic and international campaigning bodies. We see shareholder activism in uh, European and, and Western centers as well as in countries like uh, countries of production. Secondly, African states have to balance the need to attract foreign direct investment against the negative perception of foreign mine companies among the electorate and also among civil society. Some states lack effective regulatory capacity to hold companies to their pledged CSR activities. And sometimes we've seen incumbent politicians challenged by new populist uh, political attacks on mine investors. All that's contributed to growing pressure for more effective oversight of relations between companies, the state, and communities over CSR. Mine companies, and I'm going to talk very specifically about Africa generally, I think have a mixed record when it comes to CSR. Some companies have sought to engage openly, honestly, and effectively with governments and local communities, but others have treated CSR as essentially a public relations exercise. They seek to improve their image locally or internationally by providing one-off social initiatives, a football pitch here, a school classroom here, uh, that look nice in company reports or on websites, but which are not reflective of local communities' perceived needs and are not in any way accountable to local communities or local leaders. We then see a number of challenges affecting CSR today. One is a lack of consistency, often in political demands for the scale and form of CSR. National government regulation may make certain demands on companies but companies fulfilling all their legal demands may then also face different additional or even opposing demands by local authorities. Managing unrealistic expectations in a media spotlight can also be challenging. What were once the provenance of private negotiations are now conducted, as we see today, in the glare of public scrutiny, broadcast media, social media discussion. We might think that increased transparency is helpful in avoiding uh, deals, but it can also make managing demands for disparate uh, CSR impacts difficult. And thirdly, the, as I've tried to indicate, the notion of the mine community that is relevant when it comes to CSR has changed over time, has grown in size and complexity. Old mine companies in the 20th century had to reckon mainly with demands a centralized state and their workers, but today the affected community might mean a smaller, more educated workforce, but their families as well, a large number of people living close to the mine or plant, the entire population of a town or region where mining takes place, or even the country as a whole. Representation of that community is diverse, contested. Elected local politicians might not speak for everybody. The views of mainly male workers, keen to secure higher salaries, might not be the same as female agriculturalists whose crops in the vicinity of the mine may be affected by activity. Elders cannot simply straightforwardly speak for disaffected youth. Companies cannot, can, can no longer unilaterally decide who is the relevant community. And indeed, community participation is therefore vital in all these processes. To conclude, given these challenges, I think it's more challenging than previously to implement effective CSR in African mining areas. In the past, many companies could get away with a tokenistic limited form of CSR that didn't reflect real need or community prioritization. We all know where this can lead to in the worst examples. If we think about the Niger Delta in the 1990s, corporate hostility to local community needs, culpability in human rights abuses by the then military government of Nigeria led to 
environmental devastation, tension between political and social forces, and civil unrest. Now, there's no suggestion that anything like that is going to happen in most other parts of Africa, but certainly lower level so social unrest and its politicization is a present danger to extractive companies on the continent. I think everyone who's here today would agree that CSR has the potential to provide stronger relations, positive relations between mine companies, states, and relevant communities. It's therefore important to do it well, to learn from good practice, to avoid some of the pitfalls that continue to affect preparation, agreement, and implementation of CSR. And I hope our discussions, and I think our discussions will, help us to do that. The various presentations we'll hear will we'll hear how CSR programs are working both in Ghana and in different parts of the continent. And my Oxford colleagues who are here will present later today. They've all conducted research on mining activities in Burkina Faso, in Zambia, and in Ghana, and they'll share their findings with you today. In conclusion, it's very much, in my view, in the interest of African governments, both national and regional, and mine companies, to ensure that CSR agreements and projects are implemented in ways that enable the effective participation of relevant communities. And I would say that perhaps one of my disappointments about the limitations of this workshop is that we do not have direct community participants around the table today. We have mine companies, we have political leaders, we have academics, but I would say that this kind of workshop would really more direct community representatives of affected communities in the room with us participating. For companies, while doing CSR well might be bureaucratically burdensome and expensive, the cost of not doing so are much higher. In the past in Africa, good responsible corporate actors have often been outcompeted in African investment markets by unethical businesses prepared to obtain contracts by underhand means, further undermining incentives to invest in sustainable and ethical mining. It's great that such practices have become increasingly unacceptable. It's good news for good corporate actors who, in, vi in my view, have an economic interest in ensuring their CSR activities are positively reflected by affected communities as a way of excluding bad corporate actors from their field of investment and enabling their investment to play a positive social role. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to engaging with you over the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, let's give it up to Professor Mills. Thank you, Prof. Miles. You were very, very efficient with the time, and we really appreciate that. I think now um, Prof. has set the scene for us, and it's a good opportunity for us to listen to the 7 billion industry, um, the man who is the chief advocator for the industry. Let's hear from Dr. Suleiman Akoni, the CEO of Ghana Chamber of Mines. And I think he wants to use the podium. Um, <laughs> give it up to Dr. Akoni. Good morning. Good morning to all of us. I want to stand on the protocols already expressed to welcome all of us to this beautiful city of Tadi. Tadi is my second home. I whispered to someone that back in the day, my younger self, I used to spend lots of time here before I joined the chamber. So, and I used to have time here running seven years for some of my clients in my previous life. Um, I don't know where to start. Our minister, you made statements which are so untrue, and it hurts. And the very reason why, even when we are so stressed and so stretched at the Chamber Secretariat, we endeavor to practically divide ourselves into, into so many parts, to be at practically every interaction like this, because we know that some untruths will be told. Our minister mentioned and sourced the data from the GATE, Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. I was the very first person working with the then Ministry of Mines in the year 2003 
to organize the very first workshop on gaiety in Tadi. I'm a founding member of the multi-stakeholder group. I served on this committee for years until the year 2014 when I was made a CEO. Nowhere. Nowhere. And I repeat, nowhere would you find. And if you get it wrong, policy prescription becomes wrong. And that is why I'll spend some time to address this, unfortunately. It cannot be 3%. Royalty rate is 5%. Even it just tells you that if royalty is 5% and companies pay royalty 5%, where is the 3% coming from? Companies pay their corporate taxes. They pay dividends. So where is the 3% coming from? Chris, show the slides. Oftentimes, people say we defend the industry, but the facts are sacred. And we have a warm relationship with the ministry, the ministry of the Western region. I can't see too clearly from where I stand. And I want us to project this for the benefit of all of us. So I'm not, people understand I'm not just plugging figures from the air. This is something we do on a, an annual basis and you go to our website, this information is there. Anyway, let me go ahead. Last year, the year 2021, revenue from the industry is, was about $5 billion. Our $5 billion. As, as you know, do the ratios for the So, how many that are pleading as an industry? We have good partners. It's important that we are fair and engaged, as we mislead the public. It's 
such a, a grave matter for us as an industry. And it's good I'm here so that I can actually respond to these assertions which are so untrue. I would want to go back to the essence of my presentation for today. And we have been requested to speak on the efforts of the Ghana Chamber of Mines in ensuring infrastructure development projects and sustainability. As you can imagine, we don't initiate corporate social investment projects. We call them corporate social investment. They are not, we don't refer to them as corporate social responsibility. We believe that we need to invest within communities. And once you invest, you expect that there would be returns. So that, that is the main difference between what our member companies do and what other sectors of the economy do. So we have an introduction of who we are, an overview of the mining sector, financing infrastructure in mining communities, models for financing infrastructure in mining communities, as well as some conclusions. So who are we? We have a history of being around since the year 1903, under the then West Africa Chamber, Chamber of Mines. We were incorporated as a Gold Coast Chamber of Mines in the year 1928, so you can see that we have been around for a very long time. And the name was changed to Ghana Chamber of Mines after we attained independence in the year 1957. Our vision is to be the respected, effective, and unified voice for the mining industry. And our mission is to represent the mining industry in Ghana using the resources and capabilities of our members to deliver services that address members, governments, community needs to enhance sustainable development. We operate under various membership categories. We have the represented members, pre-production category, contract mining, exploration, affiliate, and associate institutions. All of these form part of the chamber. When we're talking about represented members, we are talking about those who are into production for more than a year. And we have under this category 13 large scale mining companies and then one large scale manganese producing company. Pre production companies are those who are constructing a mine or yet to achieve first anniversary of commercial production. We have one large scale gold mine under this under construction as we speak. And we also have one large scale gold mine in its first year of production. The expectation is that after a year, they will transition to become represented members. We also have contract mining staff, contract mining members who provide contract mining services to the mining companies. And that this, we have four local firms, we have three multinational firms, and then we also have one JV between a local and a multinational firm. And the exploration, we are talking about those who engage in reconnaissance and prospecting activities. And that this, we have three firms. And then we also have affiliates, those who are in the business of providing services to the industry. And that this, we have 61 firms. And then associate institutions, these are organizations who generally are not for profit or regulatory agencies. So you have the University of Mines and Technology, who are members of the Ghana Chamber of Mines because uh, we work with them closely. Their work actually impinges on the um, industry. We all know that in, in Ghana, the, the major ma mineral mine in, in, in the country is gold, followed by manganese, diamond, and, and also bauxite. The, the, the slide shows on the right-hand side a table 
indicating the revenue share for the year 2021 among these four minerals. As you can see, gold accounts for 96.98%, practically the kind of mineral economy we have. But of course, we also have other minerals, including salt, clay, silica, feldspar, limestone, iron ore, and lithium, quite recently. I think it's important that we see this slide for what it, for what it stands. It talks about distribution of mineral revenue. That for every dollar mining companies receive, where does the money go to? And it's for us very, very important. You see the gray part of the graph showing local procurement, the amount of money which goes to local vendors. So as I explained through the publish what you pay, besides the 16% which goes to the state, you have a large amount of money going into supply of goods and services. In fact, if you compute in the year 2021, the mining firms distributed and spent $3.98 billion in country, representing 79.7% of their mineral revenue. So this is what comes back to the economy, not just to the state. The states, what the states receive directly is 16%. And of the players within the supply chain of the industry, they continue to pay taxes. They employ people. When they employ people, they pay them, they pay PAYE. This goes to the state. So naturally, what will go to the state from the mining industry is far and beyond the 16% which they receive directly. I think it's important that we understand our industry. If we don't, we would always be shooting from the hip. And it can be very, very embarrassing for all of us. I have discussed this already, publish what you pay, which is the by, the by the mining industry. So financing infrastructure in mining communities. Mining companies live in communities, and it is always important to have a healthy relationship with their host communities. Some may call it social license. But the reality is that we have neighbors. Our member companies have neighbors. And they should be able to stand in the guard for these host communities. That in a manner that ensures sustainability. So in recognition of this abiding relationship, mining companies invest in various facilities for these communities. And I, I remember I mentioned that we don't do corporate social responsibility. It's a, these are investments that we do within the communities. And how do they do this? They do them either independently on their own or they seek partnerships with others. Some may be non-for-profit organizations or some may be profit-oriented private sector firms, including those within their supply chain. How are these funded? Normally we have foundations, and we know about the Gophos Foundation, Newman Achim Foundation, Anglo Ashanti Foundation. These are dedicated vehicles set up by the company. to 1%. That is the generic formula by which mining companies support these uh, foundations. Of course, there are companies who have decided not to set up their own foundations and they support their corporate social investments directly through their budgets. And these are based upon agreements between the beneficiary communities and the mining companies. 
since funding. Since funding tends to fluctuate with operational performance, most mines are moving away from this form of corporate social investment, and for good reason. A good reason being that when the fortunes of a mining company in a particular year is very poor, essentially because of the price of gold. You have a dip in price of gold. One of the things a company would want to do is to cut the frills in its expenditure, and one of them would be the corporate social investment. But if you have a dedicated funding mechanism, which is mutually agreed upon between the mining company and the communities, you don't go there and touch it. It becomes independent vehicle, and whether the company is can afford or not, that vehicle continues to run and then the projects are executed. This slide shows the cumulative corporate social investment sectoral spending, and it shows that roads in the last few years have actually taken the pride of place. Roads continue to show so much in the various expended corporate social investments of mining companies. Of course, you have education as well, and then you also have health infrastructure. So um, as far as we can see in the last few years, roads have tended to take the pride of place based upon demands from communities, as well as infrastructure and support by way of scholarships and, and, and grants given by host communities by, by, to uh, mining company you know, um, 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 indigents. And extension of electricity is one, housing is one, and, and, and water as well as sanitation, and, and then the resettlement action plan. Average expenditures in the last few years has actually hovered around $25 million per year. This slide shows some of the projects done by our member companies, or Asanko's reading projects. We have Andogul Ashanti Sustainable Development Malaria Control Program. And then, of course, I spoke about roads taking the pride of place. You have the Takwa Damine Road we all know about, costing $27 million, a 33-kilometer road, as well as the Tirano Community Water Projects. These are just a few examples. You also have the Nursing College of Intertrustal, funded by Newmont, Community Center, you know, um, funded by Adamus, and then the Oil Palm Plantation Project of Golden Star, as well as the Police Post by Perseus Mining. As a collective, we have decided that we'll pool the resources of our member companies to help the University of Mines and Technology. And there are various areas of interest for us as an industry. Infrastructure development, research grants for faculty and postgraduate students, bursary support to undertake to undergraduate students, provision of education resources and industrial training for faculty as well as students. For the first five years of this project, about $2 million will be mobilized and it will be dedicated exclusively to the University of Mines and Technology. So this slide shows some of the key areas of support. Down there on the left-hand side, you would see a groundbreaking sort cutting event for the construction of a hostel, which is now almost complete. And I'm sure by the end of January next year, it would be inaugurated. This is fully funded by the Ghana Chamber Movements uh, through its member companies. We also have a smart classroom block, which has been funded by the Ghana Chamber of Mines Special Education Fund. The occasions where mining companies would collaborate with Ghana is the incorporate to New Road. Again, Anglobo Ashanti, as part of his reorganization, reducing his footprint, has decided that it would relinquish portions of his residential facilities to um, 
KNUST as a campus. So we have a campus of KNUST within the premises of Angibul Ashanti or Boise as we speak. These are all kinds of support that are provided by many companies for their communities. I spoke about the Obwasi campus of the Nkrumah University of Science and Tech. Before Newmont decided to partner with Cocoa Board for this road to be done. And then you also have underneath the incorporated to near Brim Road. We had conversations with the Minister of Finance about two or three years ago. And we were quite elated because we thought that we were going to have a, fracture, uh, a structure which will allow us to do more corporate social investment, especially by way of roads. We all know that roads are quite expensive to construct. And therefore, when you have partnership with government, it goes a very, very long way. So we are requested to present an, a memorandum of understanding which covers a framework that will allow mining companies to offset the pre-financing of road infrastructure against their future payments of um, PAYE, possibly, and corporate tax. We all know that royalty has been taken away through the Minerals Income Investment Fund, and therefore that was not available by way of set off. So the chamber went ahead, committees together, and we got this done. Sometime last year, we submitted our proposal to the Ministry of Finance, and we are yet to get feedback from the ministry. I spoke about corporate social financing arrangement between mining companies and some private partnership. And this slide shows some of the engagements our member companies go through to be able to um, work with various partners to implement some of these uh, programs within the mining communities. This slide shows our resolve that we need to work hand in glove with governments regarding infrastructure to change the face of mining communities. Mining companies cannot do it alone. I know the minister said governments receive only 3% and therefore companies, companies should actually, you know, well, of course, my companies are already involved, as you can see from the slides. But when we advocated, our minister, and ladies and gentlemen, when we did lots of advocacy under Gaiti, Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency, for the promulgation of the Minerals Development Fund in the year 2016, and this came into being, unfortunately, we are not respecting the provisions of this law. Unfortunately, because we believe that the administrative arrangements around plowing back part of the mineral royalties to communities for development was not in the best interest of this country. And therefore, let's make sure that this is backed by law. We went ahead, we worked with parliament, and this was passed into law. And so, by law, there's a compulsion for government to retain a portion of mineral royalties to communities for development. Government doesn't respect this. And if we are all interested in development outcomes within host communities, I think we should be interested in asking questions of duty bearers. Nasikanu Wahi, where is the money? So yes, mining companies will get involved in corporate social investment. They will, as you can see, proactively supporting communities. But government also has a responsibility Mining companies can never be agents of de development by themselves. They need to work in partnership with government. So if companies have set up their own foundations through which they do, that, they would expect some collaboration. They would expect some collaboration. So it's important that these monies are retained timelessly. This slide shows 
mineral royalties and how they are dispersed and what the expectations of mining communities are as far as the proportions which will come to them. And like I have said, it is not being respected. They are not just being respected, but we have also passed legislation to say you cannot get 100% of what the law says you should get and that it should be capped. So only 75% of what you should get is what we will give you. This is what we have done to mining communities. And of this amount, there's no guarantee. In fact, history shows that even the capping is not respected. Again, full disclosure here, I'm a member of the MDF board, so I know what I'm talking about. These monies don't come. You see a photo on the right-hand side. Mr. Emmanuel Beidou had the privilege to invite me to the launch of their 10-year development program. And when I spoke, I spoke passionately about this gap in the development of many communities. Because government is not respecting the rules and the legislation that we have all passed, went through parliament, and it has been passed. It received publicity on the front page of the Daily Graphic. The next few days, the monies were released. We are even asking questions that even the, 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 the proportion goes, which goes to communities is inadequate. We need to increase that to 30%. It's woefully inadequate because these communities, if you want to have a diversified economy, we open up the economy. We always say that Accra is choked, Kumasi is choked. Why don't you open up and create infrastructure, developments which will attract people to stay within these communities? So we are saying that as a rule of thumb, Mining companies will not just sit within their offices and decide that this is what they want to do for communities. There are lots of engagement at the community level, lots of engagement with the respective assemblies, and making sure that the projects are in sync with the development priorities of these assemblies. This is quite fundamental to the projects that mining companies do, because the expectation is that these assemblies will manage these projects once they are actually handed over. We all know that mining is finite. The resources will get finished one day, they would pack and go, but the assemblies will continue to be there, and that is why they have to be involved in this project. Of course, mining companies will continue to provide funding by way of maintenance in their regular budgets, whether it's coming directly from their operational budgets or their foundations. We know that companies continue to make provision for maintenance, but ultimately, once the assemblies are involved, the expectation is that they would be able to run with this project going forward. So how do we encourage our member companies to do more corporate social investments? One way is to get them to compete among themselves under the Ghana Mining Industry Awards. Was it last week that we had our Ghana Mining Industry Awards? And I think corporate social investment was won by yours truly, Angogo Dashanti Obwasi. So yes, in the last few years, we have seen a migration of a chunk of corporate social investment going into infrastructure. What we are asking for is partnership to identify and co-finance large school infrastructure in mining communities. And we want to plead through our honorable minister. He should use his good offices to get Minister of Finance to respond to our request. In fact, the initial request came from the Minister of Finance, I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with the Honorable Minister for Finance, and we have since presented our MOU on the development of projects. It would be good to have feedback, because government would save quite a bit. Government doesn't have to go and borrow money. The 8 to 10 percent or more coupon they would have to pay on the bonds that they would go for would be avoided, because companies are going to pre-finance it. I thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Corney. Um, you, you can only have it in such forum where, <laughs> and I'll clarify that for Honorable Minister. Um, the, the, the 2019 dissemination, uh, Gaiti uh, dissemination report, the aggregators report, which happened here, I think it, in this same room, um, the Honorable Minister was here and we had a huge debate with respect to these numbers. Um, if you know the work of the Gaiti and the aggregators, for them, they go to collect information. Um, sometimes the industry players may not give all the payments they, they might have done. So with the aggregation report, um, which was summed looking at the total industry um, 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 value, of course, then it, 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 it may not look very pleasant. So I, I, I think the minister quoted what he had seen and, and, and was debated on. I believe we are in 2022, and um, things may not be the same. All right, we will move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Corney. That's um, a strong advocacy, as you always do, and we, we love you for what you do for the, for the, for the industry. Yes. Uh, I believe that um, that was a strong defense of this industry, uh, but the numbers that I quoted are the numbers that were brought by Gate. Then they are auditors. They are not industry players. So what has been paid is what they provided. And we all calculated and we got three percent. So if there's an issue, I believe that they need to do a consultation between Gate and the chamber. And then they should issue a proper statement so that the whole Ghana will know how much they generate and how much they pay government. Two. Um, I think that you made mention of the Minerals Income Development Fund. This is a workshop that I'm trying to respond quickly um, on the capital. You know that when you make a lot today and there's another lot tomorrow, the one that comes tomorrow actually supersedes the one. So there's a capping law. So it is not that government is not uh, respecting the Minerals Income Investment Fund, but there's a capital law that supersedes the minerals income and the whole Ghana MPs who represent the people agreed with the minister. And the last one on the MOU, um, at the budget, we're trying to get the minister issue something through the budget. Um, he's promised me that he issue an administrative instruction to reply to the MOU in accepting that project can go on. You know, that project started in my office with Mr. J and the rest, and then we went to Accra to have a meeting and they got you involved to do with you. So we are also following up and uh, we know that that will be very successful this year, more so not to um, borrow more to pay interest, but at least you can do the projects for us to sustain our communities. So thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much. I don't want this to be a back and forth. When I spoke about the respect for the law, it has to do with the timeliness of the release of the funds. And the law talks about the next business day. Now, how do you manage projects? when the law is black and white because of these challenges. That's why those provisions were there. So that's what I'm talking about. I know about the capping law. I know about the capping law. No. Don't let us go back and forth. I, respect, I know the capping law, which is enshrined. Everybody knows about it. It just hurts me that we know that it's the development challenges within the community. And I would expect that the Western Regional Minister, you yourself, would advocate for this not to be applied to the mining communities because we know that it's the developmental challenges there. That's what I'm saying. But it's more the timing. It is more the timing. timing. The no, no. Suleiman, Suleiman, take it easy. I never responded to the timing. I believe that as for time, we all agree it delayed. That's why we're happy that you made a statement and the ministry responded the next day. That's not what I was responding to. I was responding to the fact that you mentioned it has been capped at 75. And I was just explaining to you that that is not abuse of the law because there's a new law that says it can be capped. So I didn't respond to your time. After the time, and I support you 100%. It needs to be paid quickly so that the communities can develop. That one, I agree with you 100%. Yes. I never said that. I never said that. They are doing it at the time. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
um, uh, that, 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 that is a beauty and I think we are excited. Um, University of Oxford, Africa, uh, African Studies Center and Ghana Gold Expo Foundation is making all this happen, having this strategic mining workshop. The only opportunity you can have to, to, to hear from the passionate industry experts and the man who runs the region. You can only have it here. Um, we are live on Want to Me TV, live on Movement TV. We are also live on 10.18 Want to Me Kumasi and 95.9 Want to Me Accra. We are also streaming live on Simbet TV as well as all the Ghana Gold Expo portals, including the Facebook. We have our media partners here TV3. GTV, UTV, City TV, Kesben, and Want to Me TV again. And to our media uh, men here, please get the facts right and report them right. Thank you. We move on. We are going to hear from Dr. Kojobuzia. He is an independent non executive director of Anglo Gold Ashanti Limited. And he will be talking to us on the topic with focus on community engagement, strategies, gender focus, CSR programs. He will take about 15 to 20 minutes to deliver. So Dr. Kojo uh, Buzia, um, if you can start, or if you want to move here, you are welcome to do so as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I prefer to sit if you don't Thank you very that. much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Honorable Minister, distinguished participants. Indeed, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to address, or to at least just to have some thoughts today on the topic before us. I must say that the lively debate that we just heard between Honorable Minister and uh, the Chamber attests to the significance and the importance of this gathering today. I think we are all sort of seized by the topic before us on community engagement strategies and its gender focus. First, let me thank also the uh, the Regional Coordinating Council, as well as the Vite Work Ghana Gold Expo that is hosting this important conference. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no game saying that stakeholder management is a key competency for executives in the 21st century in the corporate world, whereby organizations must find the means and the strategies to satisfy all of stakeholders without making any compromises or cutting corners. Indeed, stakeholders are comprised of both individuals as well as institutions or organizations with vested interest in your success as a corporate entity and can impact the achievements of your goals as well as have impact on your growth as a business. These stakeholders are varied and they range from key influences both within communities and outside communities and even outside the host countries in which your operations is located, as a mining business uh, in this case. It also comprises of ambassadors, policymakers, and third party contacts, and indeed the community members themselves are primary stakeholders, particularly in our industry of mining. It is thus a process 
an iterative process, I must add, that continuously establishes relationships, partnerships, and try to sustain these relationships on an ongoing basis. Mr. Chairman, permit me to digress a little bit and focus on, we've heard quite a bit about CSR. Professor Lemaire explained the sources of sort of motivates corporate CSR. But I would like to talk about another version of CSR called ESG. It is an evolution of CSR and corporate response to this trend. And as the prof said, we have today what we call shareholder activism, an extremely important dimension of corporate social responsibility due to where it is located. This activism for the first time in the history of capitalism or what has now become shareholder capitalism is in the form of investor. Investors that oftentimes took a non sort of uh, active role among your shareholders in pushing for corporate social responsibility today are at the forefront of pushing for corporate responsibility. And this has come to be known as ESG, Environment, Social Governance Risk, where ESG has now moved to the top of investor and corporate agenda. Indeed, corporate sustainability has now emerged as a key concern under the assumption that investors should incorporate these ESG metrics or factors in order to mitigate environmental impact of their actions or activities, i.e. Uh, climate change, but also the social aspect of corporate activity, mostly human rights based uh, principles, but also the issue of diversity equity and inclusion, as well as the governance processes themselves at the corporate level that potentially harm investor interest and can impact their long-term performance of investment. So we now observe the move from CSR to ESG, particularly in the context of reporting, driven by making the business case for CSR and framed in terms of corporate sustainability. This marks a paradigmatic shift, paradigm shift from CSR based on moral obligations of corporates to society to a more risk management tool of actually based on Think that, that makes CSR more critical than it has ever been. In fact, it has not replaced CSR. Companies will still report separately on CSR issues, but the obligation to disclose in its investor relations to investors are the same issues being aggregated at the corporate level oftentimes and sort of uh, th these, these form the, the line, I should say is how does CSR impact your profit maximization? So it is inevitable, it is inescapable for the corporate not to adhere to corporate social responsibility. And, and, and just to give you an example or a sense of the importance or the benefits of CSR reporting in the corporate world, it is a way to improve your corporate risk profile 
and also to take advantage of the opportunities that are available within the corporate in order to mitigate environmental impact and socioeconomic risk of corporate activity. It is also, as I said earlier, has become critical for corporate to secure financing based on the record of their corporate social responsibility. So this is an inescapable responsibility, no longer linked with voluntary action on the part of the corporate. And of course, as we all know, in this mining sector, we need to maintain your social license to operate. And your CSR, the quality of your CSR, and the reporting metrics of your ESG report is what will keep, or at least help you to maintain your corporate social responsibility. And it does not matter even if you are not a listed company. Listed companies are usually regulated by security and exchange uh, entities or regulatory bodies, but even privately invested companies are now finding it difficult to accessing finance without a highly regarded social responsibility profile as well as your ESG reporting. So these are fundamental, and I think we need to acknowledge where we are with corporate social responsibility. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to talk a little bit about Anglo Gold Ashanti's experience in the corporate social responsibility realm. Stakeholder management or engagement is an integral part of Anglo Gold Ashanti's business operations. And if we seek to build and cultivate strong mutual benefits or beneficial relationship with stakeholders to identify the key social, government, and safety stakeholders, as well as environmental risk and opportunities to obtain our social alliances to operate. We engage in social uh, um, stakeholder engagement in a variety of ways. First, by listening to and responding to community concerns and complaints through a systematic grievance reporting process. We also participate in, in investment, social investment, which uh, Dr. Suleiman talked about, in various sectors within communities in order to improve the social economic conditions of our stakeholders, primarily the community. We also have official stakeholder engagements and meetings such as this, where we showcase our record in terms of um, CSR, but also in our relations with investors that constantly, as I referred to earlier, is keen to know the extent to which our company or our group is involved in CSR and of course our ESG record. We establish dialogue process whereby we explain and respond to changing circumstances and concerns which enable the industry to make informed decisions and judgments. As you know, effective stakeholder engagement and development of social partnerships help in securing your social alliances to operate and to protect the long-term value of the company and, of course, to position Anglo Gold Ashanti as a preferred operator wherever the company has a presence throughout the multiple jurisdictions globally that we operate. Every organization requires a community management framework as part, of his social, as part of his broader stakeholder engagement strategy in order to manage the community and, of course, its social, the social dimension of, of, of his business. And there are several frameworks and processes that enable this to be effective. We have, for example, business process framework 
whose purpose is to reduce the variation in our approach to community and social aspects and to clarify the key strategic elements in our engagement and with communities. We also have the International Association for Public Participation Spectrum for Public Participation showing different forms of engagement with increased level of public interest. Spectrum helps us to determine the level of engagement required for each different group. We are an, a subscriber to the Global Reporting Initiatives, which encourages corporate social responsibility reporting at both the national and international levels. And we have disclosures under that, as I mentioned earlier, at the global level in terms of our uh, CSR record. We also adhere to several guidelines and toolkits in various aspects of community development, which are regularly produced by industry associations, such as the ICMM, which we are a leading member uh, of this association. So ladies and gentlemen, now I now would like to make a few comments about the gender dimensions of corporate CSR or CSR. Over the years, there has been legitimately so uh, the absence of specifically devoted gender dimensions or perspective in CSR. And indeed, CSR guidelines promoting gender representation and outcomes have just recently uh, been released. Even when you look at global frameworks like UN Global Compact, there's still lack of due attention are paid to gender, issues of gender parity. So what is Anglo Gold doing in, in this area of gender-focused CSR? In the last few years, Anglo Gold has developed the gender equality and empowerment of women policy the purpose of which is to serve as a tool and framework for enhancing gender equality in the workplace and to enable the company to integrate gender into key organizational practices. There is also the Global Women's Forum at our corporate office and regional women forum at each of our operating units we do also have Future Leaders Mentorship Program, which affords training opportunities for young women professionals that joins the group. We also target women for vacant managerial and leadership positions, as well as making a conscious effort to remove the bias of gender dimension in our global training programs. It is with great satisfaction that I announce that Anglo Gold has been included in the 2021 Bloomsburg Gender Equity Index, which assesses companies based on several metrics, including those related to gender equality. Such factors include the availability of on-site lactation rooms for, uh, for women at work, as well as company support for STEM studies uh, for young women throughout different educational institutions. It is a work in progress, but we believe that Anglo Gold is making significant gains in this arena. I would like to wind down or conclude by saying that Mining companies are strongly urged today to consciously include gender-focused programs in their CSR initiatives. This will, this will ensure gender-based solutions and policies that helps all stakeholders, communities, engagement strategies that takes a holistic approach 
and involve a wide range of community stakeholders. As I said earlier, at the aggregate level, these efforts will go a long way to contribute to enhancing our ESG corporate reputation, which in today's global corporate, uh, global stakeholder capitalism, it's inescapable. With those few thoughts, remarks, I would like to end my remarks by thanking you all for the opportunity to be a part of this meeting. Thank you. Please give it up, give it up, give it up. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwejo Buzia, an independent non-executive director of Anglo Gold Ashanti. I must say I am also impressed that Anglo Gold is on the Bloomberg Gender Equity Index, and I'm sure... Um, it, it's a good thing to do and a good thing to follow. Um, I'm reminding you again that we are, we are live on Want To Me TV, Movement TV, and we are also live on Want To Me 101.3 in Kumasi, 95.9 in Accra. And we are streaming on Simbet TV as well as all the Ghana Gold Expo social media channels, including the Facebook. And I will recognize again our media partners uh, capturing what we are doing, most of you capturing live and recording. TV3, GTV, UTV, City TV, Kesben TV, ATV, we have Joy News, and we also have Empire FM uh, with us this uh, morning. We have listened to the industry as advocacy. The regional minister has welcomed us. Um, our distinguished professor, Professor Miles, has set the scene for us. And we have also taken Anglogo's version of what is happening. I think we want to hear from a small-scale mind. We want to hear their perspective, CSR, and we have here the chairman of Akunta Mining in the person of Mr. Bernard Nchibu Esiako. Chairman, want to me to give us um, their, their, their version. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Our contact is a large scale mine. Thank you for the correction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. Suleiman and Mr. Marv, senior colleagues, especially Andrew Gould Ashanti <laughs> and Edmunds Mining. Media and everybody, thank you so much. And I think it's a privilege for Akunta Mining also to be in this expo. And I will start from Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. He says that the one who want to be big must be safe. So I'm very glad, glad, uh, I'm very glad that the mining companies have set this country from Ashanti Empire, <coughs> Fantic Confederation, from Gold Coast to Ghana time, from Better Trade to Pounds and City time. Mining have done very good service to our land and our country. So I'm very, very proud to be among of the gold mining companies in Ghana. I know the government is focusing about the royalties. And the problem is not only about the royalties. And I think 
we should think beyond that and help ourselves. We have a foreign investors who have a large scale companies and we also have a local companies who also own a large scale companies. It's a very difficult for large scale, local large scale companies to have investors. So without the Ghanaian local large scale company for the government supporting them, it will be difficult for the Ghana government to reach their goal because the important uh, tool in mineral is not only about money, but it starts from the land. Every land is a land. So, so far as the land is in Ghana, I think it's an opportunity for Ghana government. I have seen MIF here. I think they have to help uh, the local Ghanaian large companies so that they also can have enough funds to do drillings and know the specific um, the gold minerals in a specific area. And once <laughs> and once we do these explorations and we have all these monies because we are local people, it means the, the money also will remain here. Because the foreigners investors, they have done well. We have to congratulate them. Because, but they borrow the money from elsewhere to come to our country. So the laws also permit them to take the huge amount of the money also from our country to go. Mr. Minister and the Chamber of Mines, I think now the learning curve the Akonta Mining is trying to propose to all of us and also to the government is that it's time for government to ha help the local Ghanaian large scale and the small scale miners. As you said in your keynote, you recognize that or you mentioned that even the mining sector we have about 7 billion. That is a contribution. And I know from 2020 to 2021, as a Bank of Ghana, Mr. Addison also declared, our growth was 40%, and the half of it is from the mining sector. That is the 7 billion you are talking about. So the change is that I will call it the I will call it the hope of gold and the hope of Ghana economy. We should open a bank. The gold mining company, we should own a bank as we have an agricultural bank. So once we have a bank and every Ghanaian, we encourage every Ghanaian to have even one kilo of gold. One kilo of gold, then the banks also we also relate, we know that the gold price is international. We have the price from the stock market. So once we know the price uh, in our local asset today, in Ghana, one kilo will be 678, 678, 800,000 Ghana cities for one kilo. As today, this morning, as I, I calculated. So, if every one person is owing one kilo of gold, and we encourage the bank also to loan them the money, assuming it's 600, and then we can borrow you money about 800,000 Ghana. So, the loan is backed by gold. <laughs> it 
In Ghana, our population, we have about 35 million. Assuming we are using about 10 billion people having one kilo of gold. If we are using 22 karat, depending the karat that you use, that will give you the amount that I'm talking about. So example, if we use the 22 karat and we use 10 million, one kilo, then you come down to 1,000. That and you use 22 carats also to, to, to go for the price, you will have 23.7 800 and something billion US dollars. Billion, we are talking about billion a year. So it means that Ghana, we can help ourselves. No. Media, you heard it right. We are moving. On uh, more, but I think uh, myself as an industry person um, 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 and from where I sit and what I see the mines doing, um, they are really doing a yeoman's job. A yeoman's job is what they are doing. And we, we, we always need to appreciate and encourage them to do more for our country, Ghana. We will move forward. And I think at this juncture, um, the regional minister would want to make a presentation to our venerable professor, Professor Miles. And I think uh, Professor Miles will also have to present um, 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 something to the regional minister. So we will do this. And right after that, we will all walk out and take the group photograph. And we will have some small bites. Just about 15, 20 minutes, we will come back.
to continue with the second section. So, Honorable Minister, I will yield to you, sir. Um, this is a very... ...choking from the 9.9 the .9 lessons from my grandmother. So, I have that one here. have the second edition on opportunity in the Guinean um, mineral sector and the current one which is the potential of mining for sustainable development I'm very grateful uh, it's really true that we should always learn from our grandmothers yes. uh, exchange I brought to the minister I was uh, told, I'm a historian by training, and I was told that the minister examples of, of popular writing about history, um, which I yeah. and the other one which is about um, the, the sort of limitations of History and the influence of history on of geography and geology, which I think is something which, as uh, as miners and as people who write about mining, we should be aware of. So I hope you'll find them interesting. And um, okay, so. Okay, the, the, the industry um, chief advocator is still worried. And um, I think Chris is here. Chris is a, a member of the And as Mr. Kone indicated, he was actively involved before he became the CEO. So I think um, he has um, um, appointed Chris. And Chris has been representing him on, on Gaiti. I will call on uh, Mr. Christopher Nyako um, to, to make a quick comment. It's a quick clarification from uh, 7 billion, 3%, 97, and all that. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm doing this clarification on, on behalf of Gaiti. Um, I think we were here last month or last two months or so for one of our dissemination engagement on our 2019 report. And I recall that the Honorable Minister asked a very pointed question to Gaiti at the time. How much of the mineral revenue does the government get? And our response in that meeting was that it is not part of the scope of Gaiti's work. Because to be able to do that, um, there are some computations that you need to do. But at the time of our report, we did not have that information. So we clarified that that was something that we were going to do going forward. So this clarification is being done on behalf of Gaiti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. And I, I, I have to let Chris do this on behalf of Gaiti, though myself, I'm an MSG member. But for the role I'm playing here, I can't speak for Gaiti. So Chris has done that. Thank you very much, please. OK, I'm told we will take the picture. So please direct us uh, to take the group picture 
inside this room. Okay, all right, so um, I think we will move into the middle to take the group photograph. So, um, the, the media man, please, you can move. Uh, Simbet, can we move this one out? Okay. Our minister, we want to take the group photograph. Okay, please, please join us. Yes, please join us here. Charlie, shake her. Yes, please, we are having the group photography. Join us, join us, join us here. Yes, please. Where do you want us to be? Okay, can we can we take the group photography, please? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we are taking it here. Akijo, please, please join us here for the group photography. Uh, in the middle here, where I'm standing. We. Please, please come close to me. We are having the group photography here. Yes, you would have all the pictures with chairman after the group photography. Chairman. Chairman. Chairman, we need you here. We, we will have all the, 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 the selfies with you after this one. You don't have one, Dr. Boati. It's here. We, we are you taking it here. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure whatever tricks that I do, um, but I will do the introduction until he enters. He took advantage of the short break. Mr. Edward Nanaya Kranti, CEO of Minerals Income and Investment Fund. Just on time. Mr. Kranti, the last seat is for you. Okay, Dr. Boati, so. Thank you. Action. Thank you very much. Um, senior governor uh, MC um, Nana Tetrete and um, with all protocol um, duly observed I am actually standing in um, of the previous protocols thank you um, I am pretty sure that my respected gentleman and lady Angela here would want to make a quick presentation. So if there is any presentation you want to do, 